started. So, of course, I want to welcome everyone. We are so glad to be here and to bring you this third session in the Moving Forward Together Back to School series. This presentation will show that resilience and a healthy brain are connected and how both are related to mental health, physical health, and possibly even longevity. Now, my name is Anna Richmond. I am a training manager for the Department of Children's Services. I will be monitoring the chat box and helping with any technical assistance issues. Just let me know if you need anything in the chat or send me an email. I'll be monitoring both. Just to let you all know that time and attendance will be monitored, particularly for the CEU certificates, as requirements dictate full participation. So those of you that may need CEU credit, and that's for our NASW social work credit, please let me know in the chat box. We are keeping up with that on a spreadsheet as well, but don't wanna miss anyone who needs that, who maybe didn't um, register for that. So let me share just a little bit about our presenter. Wendy Elmo is a speech language pathologist. She's also a brain injury specialist for BrainLink. She's board certified in neurologic communication disorders and was the clinical service supervisor for JFK Johnson Center for Head Injuries Cognitive Rehab Department, where she worked with people with brain injuries for 20 years. She's part of a national group that developed practice guidelines for TBI and stroke. Wendy also authored a book of group treatment activities and an assessment battery for mild and moderate TBI. Wendy was an adjunct faculty member at Keene University, developing and teaching their first class on traumatic brain injury. Wendy is a certified brain health coach. She has served in many leadership roles, including president of the New Jersey Speech Language Hearing Association, and ultimately received their honors of the Association Award for her distinguished service. So as you all can hear, Wendy is fantastic. I'm so lucky to have met our friends with Brain Links a few years ago, and I've worked with Wendy for a while, and I'm so glad to have her on. So Wendy, please take it away. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks so much, Anna. And uh, I, I wanna commend you because this has been a fabulous progression to get um, these three um, Dr. Perry and Caitlin Ensley have really just set me up for, at the perfect place right now to to talk about okay what do we do about all of um, what they what they talked about um, and as I was going through this I was thinking that this is really it's called resiliency and brain health but it's really resiliency in the brain brain health is going to come into it you'll hear but it's really, you know, what is the brain's role and, and what are we doing when we're becoming more resilient? What are we doing to the brain? Um, it, you've heard that I'm a speech language pathologist. I'm not a psychologist. I am, I'm not a social worker. I come to this from a few different angles. One is, um, is personally, you know, if, if you're living your life, um, you've needed to uh, potentially build some resilience in your life. You've had some hardships. Um, so it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to have to kind of dive into this deeper for me. Um, also, um, anything, talking anything about the brain is, is just fascinating to me. And I, as you heard, I worked in a brain trauma unit for 20 years. So I, I got to see people at, for most of them, at their lowest point, at the most catastrophic thing that could happen to them, you know, major brain injury and major life change. And it was really interesting to see people go through that and to see who was um, kind of walked the walker or talked the talk of resiliency and what that did for them and, and, um, and how that helped them to progress through their treatment. Um, and then how much harder it was for the people who were a little more stuck. Now, I wanna kind of give you a warning here. I tend to be, and I, for me, this, this topic is really exciting and it's, uh, I'm gonna tend to sound like this is easy, 
and it's not necessarily. So if you're someone who's going to be listening to what I, I'm going to say and say, but I've tried that and I'm still struggling, I get it. I, so right off the bat, I want to tell you, it's, it's not necessarily easy. For some, it will be, and for some, it'll just be um, kind of a, a shift, a, a, something flips into a place and they go, oh, I'm going to take that and, and change where I head. But, um, but I don't want you to think, well, I'm doing something wrong if, if I'm not in a, in a place that I want to be with this. And we can talk about that uh, much, much more later. Uh, so I am part of BrainLinks. Uh, we are funded at the federal level or grant-based program of the Tennessee Disability Coalition, fed, uh, funded at the federal level by the ACL and at the state level by the TBI State Partnership Program, the Department of Health. And we are a statewide team of brain injury specialists, and it's our job to help give you all the information that you need to work with people who have a traumatic brain injury. And let me just tell you that if you haven't been to one of our TBI talks, there are many more children, uh, parents, and, and just folks in general that have brain injuries than we are really um, aware of. Either they've been not been diagnosed or they've been diagnosed and kind of, they put that to the side because that was in the past. Um, but that is impacting them potentially in the current. So it's our job to help you to do that better, to serve them better. You can find a lot of our resources, all of our resources at our newly revised website that's beautiful at tndisability.org slash brain. And then another great resource is our YouTube um, uh, training channel where you can find lots of different, tune into the playlist that is kind of curated for you and you'll find lots of uh, good, mostly short, so you can get a quick hit of some information, um, but then there's lots of them there. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about is what is resilience? Why do we need it? What does it have to do with the brain? And then how do we get it for different ages? So what, um, Resiliency is, it's a bouncing back in the face of adversity. And it's really a process. It's, it's not necessarily, okay, this thing happened, now boom, I'm here, I'm ready. It's, you have to negotiate that process and manage it and adapt and really figure out what's going on. And it's a, um, it's a, rea it's, it's a way of process of reacting to the significant source of trauma. Um, I want to put these up because they kind of capture different aspects of resilience. So Maya Angelou, uh, I can be changed by what happens to me, but I refuse to be reduced by it. That's really a resilient sort of attitude. Yeah, things are going to come and they're going to influence my life, but I'm not going to be reduced by it. I can grow from it, but I'm not going to be reduced. Bo Taplin, she was unstoppable, not because she did not have failures or doubts, but because she continued on despite them and resilient people will keep on going and, and not stop. And, and yeah, we all have failures, but we're gonna keep on going. Carl Jung, I am not what happens to me. I am what I choose to be become. This is this, um, this self-efficacy, self-autonomy. I choose where, what I'm gonna become and what I'm gonna do with this. And then I had to put the blue one, uh, nevertheless, she persisted because I see this like in every, every store, like staples, and I have a journal that has that on it, and it's just this reminder, come on, just keep on going. So resilience is tied into brain health and mental health and physical health and even longevity. And um, those arrows, they don't just go in one direction, they go in every direction. They all influence each other. So it's important to really take care of all of them. Hardship, going through hardship has value to us. It really does. You know, we, we would love to kind of go through, sail through life, but uh, without any hardship, but it really does uh, benefit us. We can have, uh, if we look for opportunities to grow, we can have post-traumatic growth. It can have improved relationships, um, new possibilities for our lives, greater appreciation for our lives, greater sense of personal strength, spiritual development, and the hardship has the potential to make us more resilient. We have to have that hardship in order to become resilient and stronger. 
There's a really interesting study in Kauai. They, this is like a seminal study. I mean, it was like just one of the first and one of the, you know, main study where they looked at, they followed everybody that was born in Kauai in this one year. And they followed them over decades. And what they found was that the ones that had endured hardship, which put them at a greater risk for poor outcomes, one third of those did as well or better than kids that were raised in stable homes. And when they looked at the resilient kids, that one third that, that did well, they found that they were active problem solvers, they made plans, they set goals, and they had this determined mindset that was kind of like, this isn't going to ruin my life. So those are all prefrontal cortex uh, abilities, and just hold that in your mind. Um, that's going to mean more as we go on. But that was that's an, for me at this point. That's an interesting uh, out finding that they found from them. So resilience in the brain with stress, there will be change in your brain, and there will actually be more change in your brain as you become more resilient. So the stress part is a negative change in your brain. When you become resilient in response to that, you actually get it into positive change and you get more of it. And this is, this is a sense of neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to change in reaction to things. And it will change. It's just how do we want it to change? So the, the prefrontal cortex that you see up in the front of, right, right up in here in the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, which is deeper down in the brain, are activated when there's stress. But stay with me on this slide. Um, it's kind of it's kind of fascinating if if you if you follow me on it. So they're both activated. One is this thinking portion, and the other one is this very emotional portion, the amygdala. How quickly? So the messages go back and forth, back and forth during stress, a time of stress. How quickly those messages stop is how quickly you recover from that stress. The greater the resilience we have, the greater connections we have between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, and the greater activity in this prefrontal cortex uh, in general. And, and remember, I just said with the Kauai study, it's, it's planning, it's organizing, it's goal setting, all of these great things that are happening up in the front. So you have a stressor, you have this activity back and forth, back and forth. If you've got a strong prefrontal cortex, it can quiet that. Um, and then you can think through your stress. So think of a time maybe when you were very, very stressed or very, very emotional, and you, you kind of, you're scattered. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to go next. Well, if you can quiet that, you can plan and you can move and you can be safe if it's an unsafe situation. Um, so the greater the, the prefrontal cortex activity, the greater the recovery, the quieter the amygdala, the better the prefrontal cortex can plan and act without those negative emotions getting in the way. So resilience, when we're becoming more resilient, it's a brain thing. It's really something happening in our brain. So this might sound familiar, especially to all of you who work with children. Uh, it's, there's, it, it is the same as, as the adverse childhood experiences where they have those experiences. It changes the microglial cells, making them produce uh, these neurochemicals that cause inflammation that is really bad for the brain. And we know that those children are more likely to, to develop mood disorders. Uh, that's amygdala, right? Uh, poor executive functioning. Uh, decreased decision-making skills, prefrontal cortex, have weaker connections between the prefrontal cortex and other key areas, including the amygdala and some other areas. So in brain terms, resilience really is our ability, we don't, we don't know we're doing this, but when we're becoming resilient, we are calming the amygdala, that, um, that big emotional response. It's not like we're not gonna have emotions, don't worry about that. And our ability to turn on the prefrontal cortex. Stress, and this is fascinating to me, stress is what we perceive it to be. 
So uh, one person's fun is another person's terror. So this is my mother-in-law, Betty. She is, you can tell she is, if you look in the background, way high up on a, like a see-through platform on a skyscraper in Chicago. She is having the time of her life. Um, she is thriving. I went on, if you're familiar in Memphis, the, the um, pro bath shop pyramid that they have out there also has a, um, a balcony that is see-through. I went on that. It's not nearly as tall. I'm terrified. I'm not afraid of heights, but I did not like that feeling at all. So for me, that was more stressful. For Betty, it was like, woohoo, this is great. This, this for me is fascinating, um, high stress and the risk of death. There was a study that looked at 30,000 adults and they asked them how much stress they had had over the last year and whether they thought it was harmful or not to their health. They look at them eight years later and they find that the high levels of stress increased the risk of dying, but only in the people who thought that stress was harmful. That's incredible. The ones who felt that stress wasn't harmful, they had the least risk of dying, even over the people who really didn't think that they had had much stress at all. So, we really got to think about that and, and think about what, what are the implications for our children? Can we teach them to get excited about something about, so let's say uh, there's a project coming up. Can we kind of teach them that this is going to be fun? This is going to be exciting. Um, this is going to be, um, you know, just something that we're going to learn from and you've got this, uh, but so that the stress is, is perceived as a positive thing and, and not as a negative thing because it literally has implications for the length of their life. And then just to continue that, um, there were some studies uh, in, on AIDS and optimism. Those who were optimistic lived longer than those that were realistic, not even pessimistic. The optimistic people lived longer than those that were realistic. And um, you think about it, well, often if we see someone who's optimistic, we sometimes think that they're not seeing the whole picture. They haven't really thought about this and the fact that this could kill them. Um, they might not take their treatment seriously and we want them to be realistic. No. We want them to be optimistic. It is going to, uh, to potentially increase their life expectancy. Same thing with cancer and heart patients. Uh, we saw that those that were optimistic did not have a recurrence, had less recurrence of their issues, and they tended to live longer as well. And then we have Betty back again, my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law had cancer, and um, she was incredibly optimistic about it, and we were we were a little bit worried about that because um, we didn't know if she if she really understood what was happening. And she finally said to us, "Listen, I caught this in a routine checkup. I wasn't feeling any symptoms. I wasn't sick, so therefore, I'm not sick. I'm going to do everything that I need to do, but I'm not sick." She then had her surgery. And we show up in the, uh, the hospital room and she's got neon yellow sunglasses on. She's got a drink in her hand and she says, I'm at the beach. She knew full well she was in the hospital room, but she said, I'm at the beach. And that's where she was in her mind. And then she says to me in that hospital room, I had been a biker chick uh, recently for Halloween. And she said, do you still have that nose ring? And I said, I'll find you a nose ring. Why do you want it? And she said, I want to put it in my belly button because the doctor's going to have to look, lift up my shirt to see my incision and I want him to see the, the nose ring. That was her approach to the whole thing. She had a year long of, uh, go of, of treatment and kept that attitude the whole time. She is 100% um, cancer free and the whole thing was transformed for everybody. 
not just her, she changed it for us as well. And we get a choice of how we want to be. So, like I said, stress is, is linked to how long we live, longevity. And when they look at the oldest old, which is like 90 and, and 100 so centenarians, they find that they handle stress better than the average person. And they tend to, what they called it in some of these books was they tend to shed stress. It kind of just rolls right off of them. They react less negatively to something to begin with and less hostility. And they accept change as a part of life, even if it seems negative at first. I want to tell you a story. I like to tell stories because sometimes I don't remember the point afterwards, but I remember the story and the story can help bring back the point for me. So I want to tell you a couple of stories, um, like with Betty. Uh, when I first started working, I graduated from my master's program and I wanted to work in this brain trauma facility so badly. And I got the job and I was so thrilled. And shortly thereafter, they wanted to change the team structure. The people who had been there for a long time uh, were they were they were upset. They were thrown off. Uh, they did. They fought this change. And for me, I kind of stepped back and I said, "Well, listen, I'm, I I'm, I want to work here. I don't care. I, this was my dream job. I want to be here. I'm not worrying about it. And and what's the worst that's going to happen if it doesn't work? They're going to change it." Flash forward 10 years, most of us are still there because it was just this wonderful department. I was there, like you heard, for 20 years. Uh, and they want to change it again. But I remember the reaction that everybody had to the first time. And that, and so now what's happening is they, they are reacting. They don't want to change from this, this, this program, the one that they didn't want to change to. And it, it was, so remarkable to me to watch that and to realize that we don't like change and that change can be good or at least fine, you know, nothing doesn't have to be bad. And sometimes we just need to wait it out and see where it's going to go. And happening at that point in my life was just such a valuable lesson. So how can we impart that to, to children? So let's look at some ways that we build resilience in, in everybody and we'll go through some different ages. Um, so this is to remind us that there are many, many doors to go through for resilience. So if you're, if you're feeling like I'm not there, I am struggling, I don't know what to do, let's find a different door. Um, so we're going to hear lots of doors throughout this whole thing. Resilience in, in children, we'll start there. The support of one caring adult can be enough to help pull them through in a positive way. And it can be anyone. It might be, some, you, it might be you and you don't even know that it's you. It could be a coach, it could be a parent, it could be a teacher, it could be one of us. Oh, we just need the one. Uh, social connections, you'll hear that coming up over and over again, is so important, including and pulling in, like let's say that child doesn't always have um, daily connection with other people. We can say things like, I told grandma and she's so proud of you. Uh, so it's letting them know there are other people out here that are thinking about you and think that you're awesome and you're not alone. Teaching kids to be able to ask for help. So yes, we want some self-sufficiency. We want some independence. That's going to be important. But we also can say to them things like, who have you asked for, for help? Have you asked anybody for help with this yet? And that just lets that, I, that be known that you're not in this all by yourself. You can ask for help. There are people here who can help you. We help them to face their fear with supports. So yeah, things are gonna be scary for us sometimes, but let's support each other through it. Exercise, we'll also come back to again. Um, it's amazing what it does for the brain. It strengthens it, it increases the neurochemicals that, that calm stress. Um, again, I think it's so cool to think about what's, that there's actually literally physical things happening when we're doing these positive things for ourselves. Building the executive functioning. Think, think back to the people in Kauai, the ones who were the most resilient. We need to, they had good executive functions, that prefrontal cortex function. 
uh, we can build that by doing things like establishing routines. R routines also help to us to keep calm. We know what's coming, but it gives us a template for um, for what happens next. And so we can plan and we can think about that. Building problem solving skills, asking questions like, well, what's worked for you before? Tell me every idea you have, even the most silly. Let's break it down into steps. Let's tell me the good and the bad of that solution. Play, creative play is great. It just, uh, it, it allows the brain to really um, go in lots of different directions where there's no boundaries. I can come up with anything. Uh, board games are really great as well. They're, they're kind of teaching turn taking and, um, and, and what comes next. And then memory games, obviously for building the memory. We want them to have some independence that builds executive functions, but we need them to have the ability to disagree. Um, I always gave my kids, uh, I said, listen, you, you know, you can tell me this is, this is what we're going to do. If you disagree with that, you can tell me it might not change anything, but it might. And often it did. They would think of, even when they were young, they would think of something that I didn't think of, or they would think of a plan that worked just as well. And it was important to give them that voice and that, that ability to, to think and, and, um, and all of that and make some of their own decisions. Uh, meditation is incredible for the brain. Really it, it, such a great gift to be able to teach children young to be able to meditate because it is something that you can, um, you can take with you when you're not meditating. So, you can, um, my ability, because I meditated for years, my ability to kind of go into a situation and go, okay, let's calm down, is so much better than it was because of this history of meditating. And it's not something that you do once and, and you're there. Um, it takes some time. Uh, it changes the brain. It increases the gray matter volume, which likely helps us uh, to ward off Alzheimer's as we get older. It quiets down that part of the brain that is constantly chattering, that some people call it the monkey mind, that gets in our way and it, it makes us anxious. It increases the hippocampus, which is memory and new learning, and it decreases the amygdala, which is the, the crazy emotion. Um, it doesn't, it's, again, it's not gonna get rid of emotion. We don't have to worry about that. And then it's effective for depression and chronic pain, anxiety, attention deficit, addiction, and on and on and on. Meditation has just been linked to so many positive outcomes. Uh, lots of different ways to meditate. So if you sit quietly and try to quiet your mind and that doesn't work for you, don't give up on it. Um, and don't think that just because, you know, my mind won't be quiet, that it's, it's not going to be the first time. It's not going to be the 10th time. Uh, it may not have to be also be after years, but it's going to get quieter. And uh, you can do things to occupy your brain, like saying a mantra, saying something over and over again, uh, saying a prayer um, that you have memorized, uh, a guided meditation. You can go on YouTube and find all kinds of guided meditations and pre progressive relaxations where you are relaxing. Then this is great for kids progressive relaxation where you relax one part of your body and then it increases and eventually is the entire body. And um, I used to, my kids call them um, relaxions. Uh, I used to do them with them when they were little to help them fall asleep and they loved it. And it would help, it would help them to fall asleep. And it would, it's, it's get, you can look it up on YouTube, but it's things like um, breathing in and the warm air is coming in through your feet and it's swirling around your feet. and relaxing your feet and going back out. And then with the next breath, next breath, it goes a little higher and on and on. Um, mindfulness is really being in the moment. So when you're eating, you're not watching TV, but you're paying attention to how much you're putting into your mouth, what the fork feels like, what the chewing is like, swallowing every bite. Um, you can also do this with walking going out and walking and feeling each step and the breeze and just being very much mindful of everything that's happening. Uh, again, YouTube is a treasure trove for this kind of thing. You can go on and find um, um, all kinds of meditations for different ages of 
children and, and adults. Uh, this is our uh, pufferfish. It looks like he's not going to go, but uh, I love him. He, uh, he's not ours. <laughs> I've adopted him as mine. But he, um, if you go to headachereliefguide.com and you find him there, there are other ones, but I like him the best. He will go in. You take a deep breath. He goes up, and then he goes down. You breathe in and you breathe out, and the breath influences our nervous system response. It's really hard to be stressed if you are deep breathing. Um, it, it will start to change things. Your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your circulation can all be affected by changing the speed, the rhythm, and the depth of our breathing. So it's a great first step. And this pufferfish, I love them as an adult. But, um, but children, it's really great for, for children as well. He might be a good place to just show it and doing it with him. Do it, and then that might be able to lead into meditation. It can be a part of your meditation. Um, so also building resilience, more doors. Uh, we need to build feelings of competence and a sense of mastery in kids. So saying things like, you can do this, you got this, you are so good at this. And, um, and saying it when it is something maybe simpler for them and that it is, um, it's easy so that then they feel that when they get to a harder thing, they know that they are good at things. I am good at things. And it, get, it builds that sense of, um, instead of the apocalypse loading, like, oh my gosh, it's doom and gloom and it's coming. I have the ability to cancel this out, to change this apocalypse. Um, nurture optimism. What is good about this situation? Um, like the situation with Betty, she could have picked tons of negative things about her um, her cancer situation, but she focused on the positive things, and that's what got us all through. Um, and there's there's I'm not going to say that absolute that there's positive in everything, so I can't think of all the situations that y'all might have been through, but um, there's usually something, even if it's kind of outside of the situation, like um, and it, it might not be optimism, it might be gratitude. Um, like like um, the weather, or being able to wear your favorite sweatshirt, uh, sweater or sweatshirt. You know, sometimes you're just looking for anything, knowing that it is changing something in your brain. Teach to reframe, and um, it, so this reframing, I think for me anyway in my life has been one of the most powerful things. It is when you can see the situation from a different angle. Um, and it, these, I, I don't love these sentences right or, that are right here because I think it's bigger than that. Um, so it's like, I'll tell you, there's, you see them in um, TV all the time, so in movies. I would encourage you to look for them so you got an idea of what I was looking for. But in a recent, I was watching, watching um, The Flash. Uh, I love superhero stuff. Um, I was watching The Flash, and one of the characters got to go back in time. I know we don't, go, we don't get to do that. But it gives a good example of, of a reframe. Um, he, he was so mad at his father. He hated his father because his father was never there for him. And of course, he got to go back in time, see his father who um, worked so hard. He was never home because he was working so hard that his son, so his son would have a better situation than he did. And he was always setting up these little things that um, the son could learn from and gain from when he wasn't at work. So of course it's it's like reframe is these poof it's these it's these radical changes in thinking about some uh, about something that can drastically change the situation. So anytime those are legit, they're worth sharing if you see it from a different perspective. Um, don't rush in too fast to fix things for them. Uh, meet them where they are. We can't run in and say, oh, this is great. You're going to get through this when it's too early. They're not ready to hear that. Uh, they need more time, and and sometimes, um, and I would say I'm fairly resilient. Sometimes I need to cry. I just do, you know. Uh, um, if someone passes, um, you need to be sad, and you need to honor that because it's in there, and get that out, and then I can go. Okay, what are my tools? I, let me go and and try to get myself out of this now. And you know, you backslide because it's a lot, um, but but you know what to do to kind of keep on going and don't beat yourself up when you have that bad day again. Just recognize that you are going to have some of those. 
um, having a role model or a hero, even if it, if it is a superhero, like the flash, it's that, it's that something greater to be aspiring to and having that model there. Again, the relationships, really important, letting them talk, express themselves and letting them know they're loved unconditionally. So this is, um, yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't love what you did. I didn't love the behavior, but I love you so that they're not taking from being yelled at because they did do something that they can't do again. It might've even been unsafe, but taking that you still love them. It's just the behavior that is not okay. Um, this is so important. They are watching us. And if we don't model resiliency, then, um, then they're not going to, uh, they're not going to learn it as well. They certainly can still learn it, but we need to, to be resilient. Think about how do you respond during stress? What are the words you use? What are your behavior? Do you lean on your relationships? Do you have healthy relationships around? And it's promoting faith, hope, optimism, and strength in adversity. Now, this doesn't mean that, so let's say, remember, I just said we have bad days. Um, it doesn't mean that we fake it through them. What we say is, you know what, I am really sad today but um, I, I called your Aunt Linda and that really helped me. Um, or, you know, I, I know that I'm, I'm sad right now, but I'm not gonna be sad forever. It's that idea that we get through this. Uh, here are, some of these are, they call it the 10 best. I, I would say there are some really good ones here. So maybe finding your own for each of these things for, for getting humor. Um, so let's say number three, distraction. Let's take a break right now, right? Sometimes we just need to break from it, decrease the stress, maybe go and do our deep breathing. Um, some of those things are really good, uh, but um, let's see, what's another one? Um, taking action to get, okay, all right, all right, so then what are we gonna do about this? What can we do? Some other ones like the humor one, come on, laugh it off. Well, if, there are times that if you told me that, I would probably want to smack you. I probably would. So, uh, but you can't say that at certain times, but, but if you've developed kind of a saying that you say um, in the good times and then they, they know where you're coming from, then that can be different. But kind of look for a way to maybe um, introduce humor if it's appropriate. Again, it can always be too soon. Um, and let's move on to teens a little bit, and, and they build on each other. Uh, everything pretty much that's good for children is gonna work for teens, so we're just adding a few more, and many, many more doors. Um, having a refuge, a quiet place to escape to can be really helpful. Now, we don't want them up in their room all the time by themselves, but having that as an option sometimes is helpful. It, it's not always bad. Um, having a way to express themselves, music, uh, poetry, singing even to uh, music that is expressing their feeling is a way to get it out, uh, writing, um, and then continue to model. If we feel like at the teenage years that they're not paying any attention to us, they're sometimes even um, maybe disrespecting what we're saying or disregarding, I should say, disregarding what we're saying. Um, but often those things will come back to, uh, so you know that they were listening, but so always model what you want them to hear. And this is, um, this, uh, it's all good in the, if, in the end. If it's not good, it's not the end. Um, this was on a greeting card that I hung up and it looked just like that. It was square and this black and white and I hung it on the, uh, the mirror when my kids were, were pretty young because I knew that there were gonna be times in their lives because I had had them where they were gonna go through some stuff that I wasn't even gonna know about. I wasn't even gonna know that it happened. And I wanted them to know, I think the hardest thing with kids is that they, they haven't necessarily been through something and gotten to the other side. So they don't know that you get to the other side, this too will end. And I wanted them to know that. And we, we never, I mean, every once in a while we talk about it, but it wasn't, it wasn't a thing. It was just there, always there. We moved uh, several times, they moved it. They moved it and put it back in their bathroom. Um, my daughter went through a, a very difficult experience when she was in her teenage years. After that, she said to me, I just kept on thinking, okay, it's not good right now. 
So if it's not good, it's not the end. And I was just so thankful that I had put that there because it was getting her through, even though I didn't know it. Um, that sense of mastery that we talked about before, that I can control this. Professional help, really at any age, it doesn't have to be in the teens, but they can often help to really reframe things. They'll do lots of other wonderful things, but I think some of sometimes it's that reframe that can be so important. Uh, volunteer work, that sense of mastery and control and responsibility, a job, very important. And then we need to help them to develop autonomy, self-reliance. You don't have to rely on yourself all the time or totally, but you can. You're strong, you can do this. Those relationships, so important around them, that feeling that I'm not alone. Doesn't even have to be a ton of relationships, but some key relationships that they know they're not alone. Um, having that sense of initiative, they can take charge of their own lives, humor and optimism in difficult situations. We're looking for what could be funny about this. Um, you know, it's kind of, <laughs> have you ever laughed and said, oh my God, it can't get much worse. Um, but it just, it just takes a little bit off right at that time and changes your neurochemicals, just gives you a spurt of the good stuff. Um, morality, this sense of doing the right thing of when, from the time my, my kids were very young, they're in their, their 20s, mid to late 20s now, um, my husband was always saying to them, do the right thing. And he'd say, well, let's do the right thing. And then he'd help them figure out what the right thing was. As they got older, he'd bring them something and he'd go, do the right thing. Because he knew that they knew what the right thing was. They were just coming to him, hoping that he would give them permission to not have to do the right thing. Um, so he'd help when he needed to. And then when he didn't, he would just leave it as do the right thing. And to this day, they are grounded in that concept. And I'm making it sound like my kids are perfect. They're not, they're not, but, um, but they are good kids. Um, and they have um, a sense of, of resilience and bouncing back. Um, helping children to have an awareness of their stressors. What, so well, it seems that when you have a test coming up, that's very stressful for you. What can we do to make that better? And then also I would add to that, what does stress feel like to them? How do I know? when I'm stressed so that I know to do something about it. Um, having a passion in life, but it doesn't have to be a passion for life. What I was passionate about as a, as a, a child, say in elementary years, is not what I was passionate about as a teenager, which was not what I'm passionate about now. But it's trying to help them to have a passion for something that is really incredible, helpful, and can be that, that refuge for them. Um, more doors, self-care, really important to take care of yourself, um, relaxation, trying new things, broadening that, what I'm good at, what I'm capable of, set reasonable goals, not putting your expectations too high, uh, taking breaks, consistent routine, and then accepting change. We've talked about these, um, some things about adults. So. Again, they're gonna be for everybody. I've just kind of separated them out a little bit. Anything that is going to help your brain is going to help you to be more resilient because it is going to give you the best platform to be able to, to jump off of, to be resilient. If you are, um, if you're not feeling your body well, uh, if you're exhausted, then you're not gonna be very resilient. Think about how easy it is to kind of just break down and say, I quit, this is it, when you're exhausted. Um, we're trying to give the good platform. So one of those is um, is music. Music is important for just relaxation. Make sure you're playing the right music to get you relaxed, unless you want to be energized in a positive way. I also know there are songs I can put on that will take me to a deep, dark place. Um, so knowing when it's okay to, to listen to those, because they that can, sometimes that's still good, important, but um, but also knowing when to not play those songs because knowing they're going to take you to a place that's going to be harder for you to get out of. Um, it can help you to recover from situations. So you put on that playlist that you know is, is going to be what you need right now. And then it is also good for the, for your brain because music lights up um, parts of your brain. And there's a lot of studies now that, that look at music and Alzheimer's disease and what it, they, they're playing music and they call it like the playlist of your life. 
So getting songs that would have been meaningful to them in their the, typically going back into teenage years and whatever you know is is um, would have been stimulating to them. And they'll just watch the brain light up when they're just listening to it. And then they'll also see that sometimes they'll start either they'll start moving in their chair or they'll start, they'll stand up and start dancing if they're physically capable. And sometimes they'll sing when somebody, you might have somebody who, who was not able to sing to speak and they're singing with it. And sometimes it'll even carry over into the ability to have a conversation um, afterwards, after the music is off. So just listening lights up some parts of your brain, listening and singing uh, lights up more parts of your brain, listening, singing, and dancing lights up even more. So, so good. And so I think, okay, if we can see this change in people who have a, a significant disease process going, what can happen if we are using this throughout our life? If we're bringing in uh, music <clears throat> and, and doing different things with it. Uh, healthy food. So a whole food plant-based diet is the best diet for, and I, I have there formerly known as vegan. A lot of people think of it as uh, it's, it's a healthier of a vegan diet, vegan, a lot of things are vegan, which means no uh, dairy or meat, but they're not necessarily still good for you. I always use the example of, you know, potato chips and, and, um, and French fries, depending on what they're fried in, are vegan, that they're not good for you. They're not part of a whole food plant-based diet. Um, other people will say that uh, that whole food plant-based also means you can have some meat, but you're not gonna make it a big part of your diet, uh, you, you're going to make fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and then legumes, peas, beans, lentils, as the main part of your diet. Um, I'll tell you that I was a vegetarian many years ago for many years, and, um, and now I would call myself a whole food plant-based, and I will have occasional meal, meat because I, I just, I don't want to be in a place um, where I feel like I can't. And, and usually I'll choose not because I can. Um, so for me, it's just a mind game I play with myself. The healthy food supports uh, your brain and behavior. So it, it gives the brain the best, um, the best diet to decrease inflammation. It also um, uh, supports circulation and it supports a healthy, um, happy, approach to life and will decrease depression. There have been studies around that. Also studies around behavior. So if you have someone who is um, aggressive, angry, uh, whole, fruits and vegetables, just pile on the fruits and vegetables and you, you'll see that change over time, according to the studies. Now faith, I felt like it was really important to mention faith, even if, even if we have people here who are not faith-based, but faith, that's absolutely fine. But it was fascinating to me, the, all the different components to faith that support resiliency. And I was like, well, faith is kind of here for resilience, at least in, in large part. So if you think about prayer and meditation, they're both very calming. Uh, I know that I'm not somebody who prays all the time, but when there is a situation, say with a family member that is out of state, that has has a, a problem and I, there's nothing I can do about it, I find myself instantly resorting to prayer because for me, it gives me a sense of control. Now, yes, I do and believe in the power of prayer, but it just gave me a sense of there is something I can do. And that's really important um, from a resilience point of view, uh, meditation, uh, giving and serving. This develops empathy. Again, you don't have to be faith-based to do this, uh, but it's usually a component of faith. Um, giving and serving the empathy, the perspective taking is so important. Sabbath, a lot of religions have a Sabbath, which is where you don't do certain things on that day. Imagine a Sabbath from electronics. Wouldn't that be cool? That it's not just maybe you can't have your phone at the dinner table, but now every Saturday or every Sunday, the tablet goes away, the TV goes away, and the phone goes away. That would be an incredible thing. Um, faith usually brings in the sense of community that you've heard me talk about being so important. 
for our own support. And then some of the concepts that are a part of faith and life perspectives, one of the biggest that comes to mind, there are many, many, but one of the biggest things is you've heard people say, everything happens for a reason. And that may not do it for you. Uh, you might even get angry at hearing that. But for some people, you watch them and it's, um, it, it, it really gives them everything they need to get through that situation. This is happening for a reason. So it's not for me to know. Um, that's the approach. It's not for me to necessarily know. Maybe I'll find it out later, but, um, but it's happening for a reason. And that gives them that ability to kind of step back and have a different perspective on things. And if you, if you are faith-based, I'd encourage you to kind of think about all the other concepts that, um, that are in your faith that help you to kind of bounce back. Um, exercise, I've said, is it's just, it's so important. Uh, it helps with depression. There was one, uh, it, there's many, many studies now, but there is a key study that showed that at 12 weeks, exercise was as effective as antidepressants. And by 10 months, it was actually better. Uh, now, stay on your antidepressants. So you do not want to just come off of them, but uh, you know, work with your doctor, tell them the exercise program that you're going to do and help them to monitor with you. But the, the tough thing about exercise and depression is that's kind of the last thing that you want to do. But if you can now understand it from a brain perspective to say, this is changing my brain. And if I don't want to feel like this anymore, it is something that I'm going to have to, um, to, um, to, to do. I'm going to have to do that. Um, Heather, yeah, if you email me, I will, I will find the study again. Um, and uh, my email is at the end. Um, and then it helps with focus. So children with attention deficit, uh, it helps everyone to focus. It decreases stress, lowers blood pressure. I want you to think about COVID as we're going through this list here. Lowers blood pressure, helps control sugar levels, helps maintain a healthy weight, it boosts your immunity, um, boosts that brain circulation to keep it healthy, so, so much more. So exercise, even if you've never done it, find something that you like. <clears throat> and best exercise is gonna be cardiovascular, at least for your brain. Yoga, awesome, stretching, awesome. But for your brain, you need something that's gonna get your heart rate going. Um, okay, so sleep is, is critical. It helps your brain to, to clean itself of toxins and plaques. And those are the things that help us to help our brains to uh, deteriorate over time. The plaques are part of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And if it's not clean, it causes um, brain fog, memory issues, and then ultimately dementia of, of any of the varying types. Um, and then lack of sleep, it impacts our emotional control and the ability to think a few steps ahead. That's all prefrontal cortex. It also increases the amygdala in terms of strengthening it, which increases um, our ability to control our emotional reaction and, to, and to, to dampen it, like we talked about earlier. Sleep is a key part of that. Listen to this. Two nights of no sleep increases symptoms of depression, paranoia, and anxiety. So sleep is, is just critical. Some things that you can do, um, treat sleep apnea, that might mean a CPAP machine, might mean the exercise and losing weight. Um, getting seven to eight hours a night of sleep if you are an adult. Now, if you're looking for a child, uh, WebMD has a great um, parenting guide for just telling you the different hours. Those are approximations. Some might need uh, a little bit more, some might need a little bit less, but it'll give you a, an idea. Uh, reduce and manage our stress. We'll talk about a little bit more about that in the in the in the coming slides. We've talked about that a bit already. Um, reduce maybe a, a use of electronic devices at night. Stick to a regular schedule. Your body gets to know when it's time to go to bed and when it's time to wake up. Reduce um, caffeine, especially at night, and maybe instead you drink chamomile tea, which is calming. And then kill the ants. These are automatic negative thoughts. So. I'll, um, many people have them where you're being told uh, you're not good enough, um, you didn't do enough today. Uh, 
we got to kill them. We got to um, go in and kind of start to flip them around. Um, we can talk much, much more about that, but figure out what keeps you up at night and fix that. Um, positive self-talk is so important. Again, I just talked about the negative chatter. We talked about the negative chatter with, or we talked about chatter with meditation. The brain releases similar chemicals during negative self-talk as it does during depression. So it stands to reason that we can literally talk ourselves into depression. If you're hearing this negativity all the time, whether it's external or even internal, it's producing these negative chemicals that, um, that can potentially lead to depression. Your thoughts have biochemical counterparts. Again, it's, it's ha stuff happening in the brain. Your thoughts are things, you've probably heard that before. They are collections of neurotransmitters and nerve cell connections that can be triggered by electrical stimulation of the brain. They're things. So we gotta get the positive self-talk. And this, so let's say you're like, okay, I'm a negative self-talker. First thing, we gotta know that. Second thing, we gotta start to identify when you're hearing those negative things. And then third, you, you cancel it out. So if you just said a negative thing, is that really true? It's not. Um, it's, this is what's really true. And then next, we start to replace and, and we start to hear the positive. That is an effort and it is one well worth taking and, and embarking on right now, but it is, it is well worth it. And you, you can probably enlist some of the people in your life because they probably, um, if you're a negative inside, you're probably responding with, um, with oh my gosh, and this is, this is gonna be bad type of things, and they can help you externally to catch them, uh, if, if it's a, a, someone that you trust. Okay, this is so simple, but it's, it's really incredible. So stay, stay with me here. It is what it is. So something happens, it is what it is. It's kind of like that idea of something happened for a reason that they look at it as, okay, well, it just is. It's, it, I don't know if this is good or bad. Um, it just is what it is. It allows us to step back from the emotion of it. It doesn't have to be bad. It just is. Okay, I have this cancer. I don't like that at all, but it is what it is. I don't have to go into, just like Betty, I don't have to go into the negativity of it I can go into, this is what I've got right now, this is what's on my plate, and here's how I'm going to approach it. There, it reminds me of that story that you might have heard, and I'll way paraphrase this, of the, the old farmer who had a horse, and he had a son, and he had, the horse gets out one day, and he runs into the hills, and the, um, the townspeople say, oh, this is terrible, this is terrible, and he says, well, maybe. The... Um, Next day, his son, the, uh, the next day, the horses, the, his horse comes back with a bunch of wild horses. And, and now they're, they're, they're his. And the townspeople say, this is wonderful. And he says, well, maybe. The next day, the son starts to tame the wild horses and is thrown off and breaks his leg. And they say, this is terrible. And he says, well, maybe. And the next day, um, the military comes into the town and is taking away everybody of all the males of fighting age. They can't take his son and they say, this is great. And he says, well, maybe. So you get the point of sometimes if we just wait something out, we realize it wasn't what we thought. It wasn't maybe as good as we thought, but it wasn't as bad as we thought. So it's just this idea of it is what it is and let's kind of hold back some of that emotional turmoil and that judgment to just deal with, with what it is. And again, that's gonna allow our prefrontal cortex to kick in and actually solve this with us and for us. And just one more thing, because this is probably my favorite thing on stress. Um, if you have some fear, if you're a worrier, if you have some fear of pain or suffering, examine if there's anything that you can do about it. If there's something that you can do about it, do it and don't worry, right? You've got control now. Don't, don't worry, just do it. If there's nothing you can do, then there's no need to worry, right? 
So bottom line is from the Dalai Lama, there's never a time to worry. Either, either take what control you have and use it, or you don't have any, and you wait and see. And think about how often that bad thing that you waited for never came. So it was this worry for nothing. And all that now, think about all of the brain chemicals, all the negativity that you were sending to your brain when you didn't need to. Uh, so I, I would be remiss being working for a brain injury organization if I did not speak a little bit about traumatic brain injury. Um, and I think a lot of this also will relate to uh, some of the, the folks that you're working with. Um, resilience in people with traumatic brain injury does seem to be similar to people without a brain injury. That was, um, on the one hand, that was remarkable to me. And on the other hand, I kind of thought back to what I knew in working with people. And I saw many people with brain injuries who were uh, very resilient. And it just came in with such a positive attitude and watching the outcome that that had for them. Um, the severity, uh, the intelligence before the injury and cognitive flexibility didn't predict resilience. Uh, so you would kind of think that you could say, okay, that's a severe injury that's gonna make it harder, not necessarily. Um, and then some things that did in fact, um, influence it though, uh, if you were of a minority status, it was harder to be resilient. Um, substance abuse before the injury, higher anxiety, a higher disability status, um, all made it harder to be resilient. Resilient. Um, and what I think, where here's where I think it also relates to folks that that you might be working with if you work in this field, is uh, not just traumatic brain injury, but in the children that you're working with and the families that you're working with. And think about the parents and consider also that the parents could have had a TBI. That could be why we're now looking at the situation that we are with the child. Um, but we need to potentially look at what their resilience level is and there are different ways to uh, also kind of measure it. Uh, and then maybe incorp be incorporating that into your working with the, some, the person and into maybe uh, you know, the, the future plan for them, how can we help to be more resilient? Hopefully now you'll be saying all the things that will help them to be more resilient as well. Uh, we have a document that goes more into brain health. Uh, you can find it on our website at tndisability.org slash brain, and it'll go into more depth in some of the things that we talked about and some additional ones that specifically are related to how do you be healthy, how do you have a healthy brain? Uh, and then there are more tools. Most of them are going to be more related to uh, to traumatic brain injury and recovery from that. There are some really great tools. And again, I want you to t to consider that um, you are. We know from the data you are working with more people than you are aware who have had traumatic brain injury, and that is both the children, the teens, and the parents that you're working with. Uh, so have that in the back of your mind. And you can also go to, we have done a series for DCS on traumatic brain injury, and you can go through that and, um, and you can go and listen to those earlier ones if you want to learn more about traumatic brain injury. Um, just a couple more slides here. Um, if you would please um, take our one minute survey, you can e either read that QR code and, and go and do it. It's really quick and it helps us with our grant efforts, um, or you can go to, um, I'm sure somebody here is going to put that link into the chat box. Uh, I know Anna has it and Jennifer has it. Um, and there it is, just like magic. It was also the very first thing in the in the chat. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, I would really appreciate it. You can just put um, Wendy in there and resilience is good enough. And August 17th is all the information that you're going to need to know there. And um, we thank you from BrainLinks so much. And any questions? And I'm going to leave this up while we take any questions that you might have. And, and keep in mind also, if, if, if questions occur to you, come back next week because you're going to have the opportunity to ask questions of everybody um, that has presented here, all three of us. And then some more experts. Um, so, Anna, you might even want to give them a little bit more information on that, but um, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thanks, Mona.
Harrison and Veronica, thank you so much. No questions? Saving them for next week, Wendy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, we do okay, have a question. Okay, here we go. If someone is on an anxiety medication or similar, does this affect the brain's ability to manage or adapt to stress, et cetera? Does the medicine change the neuroplasticity of the brain? Um, and the ability to manage or adjust to stress, et cetera. Um, so it is, it, depending on what the medication is, it is having an impact on some part of the brain. And it can be, um, so it can be extremely helpful. So if you are, uh, there are times when medications are, are absolutely could be a part of the solution. So you want to, you want to listen to your physician for sure, and maybe now you bring in some other information and you say, are we at a point where we could consider something, um, something else? Could I, uh, they're committed to, to doing some exercise or to doing meditation. Can you work with us to come off of this medication or um, monitor them through this? Uh, but, but it's, it's so, Yes, there, because there is something physically happening in the brain, something is lit up, depending on whether it's anxiety or depression or a bipolar or anything. It's, those are different parts of the brain. You can also have um, depression can be caused by different parts of the brain being lit up. So the medication is important, which is why you'll often see that there, there's a switching of medication because one's not working, it's because it wasn't targeting the right part of the brain. So you always want to keep that in mind that maybe there's a different medication that would do it um, differently. Um, but stay on it if you're on it and work with your doctor to, and, and start incorporating some of these things. Certainly there are people who come off of their, their medications, but um, you want to do it in a safe way. Um, hopefully that answered your question, but definitely start incorporating some of these things. Um, what is the relationship, and if I didn't answer that fully, you can type in, what is the relationship between perspective and gratitude with resiliency? How can we best help someone to gain a broader, broader perspective of their situation, express gratitude for where they are, and build resiliency from that? Um, great question. Um, gratitude is so linked with resiliency because it's, um, it is, putting those gratitude is, is pumping those positive chemicals in it is quieting the amygdala it is um it's, it's just doing great things in the brain so we want to foster a an attitude of gratitude and that can happen in a lot of different ways you might um so yes we want it to be an ongoing thing where i find gratitude in everything but we also want to make it something maybe more specifically where every day. So if we have someone who really needs to be kind of switching this, every day you write down two things that you're grateful for. Uh, I like to do it at the end of the day because I then I look back on that day. And some people like to do it at the beginning of the day. Now, I don't know what has happened, but there's still something to be grateful for at the start. So by all means, you do it. Um, you can do it both. And it, it means also um, just doing it in every situation, being that good model. So I often use the example of even when there's someone who is in the hospital room and it's the first day and they're in the hospital bed and, and you don't know how things are going to go. Um, for me, I can look out the window and be grateful for the weather because I love rain and I love the, the, the sun. Um, but there's always something to be grateful for. Um, and it's finding that grateful that they're still alive. Uh, but you find something to be positive about and then teaching children to be that, to gain that greater perspective. Um, did I answer? Let me see, scroll back and see if I answered all of that. Yeah, and then that will help you to build resiliency because you're you're building your building up your brain. So like I said earlier, um, sometimes I might make it sound easy. I know it's not, believe me. Um, it takes work sometimes. For my mother-in-law, it's a default now. She's 80. Um, I I, she just texted me 
saying, feeling blessed. I, I swear on everything important to me. She just randomly texted me and said, feeling blessed. Um, so if we can just, just think about Betty as you're going through your life and, uh, and we'll all be in a better place. Well, thank you, Wendy. Oh, we've just got another comment, Wendy. You may want to look at that. Um, I sustained a brain injury a year ago when I first started this position. Since the injury isn't noticeable like a broken bone, people tend to forget or not realize that you're still healing. Absolutely. And um, please, if you want to reach out to any of us, um, we can, if you're, if you're still having any issues, we can help you out with that, but we absolutely get that. It's called the silent epidemic for that reason that people don't realize. What I would um, suggest to you is that um, you take all of this today to heart, that you focus on all of the positive, and you may already be doing this, but you focus on the positive. I've, we've all watched people who get caught in what they've lost and, and Again, if you now put that in the perspective of what we've talked about here today, we want to be focusing on what we have, um, what we, um, uh, what is still good, what the supports are, those kind of things. Focus on anything that's positive, so you get the positive stuff um, rolling in your brain. Thank you so much, Wendy, for sharing all your knowledge with us today. And I love hearing about your mother-in-law. She sounds like a fantastic lady. <laughs> she so is. thank you again for sharing those personal stories as well. And thank you to all of our participants today. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed today's session. And we hope you've been able to participate in the sessions before this in the series. We do close out next week. Um, on same day, same time, um, with a Q&A, a panel, so you'll be able to hear from all of our um, presenters and then some additional folks um, to give you some resources and share some ideas around um, the impact that this pandemic has, um, particularly as we return to school. Um, so thank you all again. If you need anything from me or have any follow up just let me know either um, by email or you can also give me a phone call. Um, but we do hope you enjoyed the presentation today. A reminder for those um, that requested CEUs, um, just let me know that you're still here and that you would like your CEUs in the chat box. And we'll also be monitoring that in our WebEx as well. Be on the lookout for a follow-up email from me um, in the next few days. Um, appreciate all of you all. And thank you again, Wendy, and all of our friends at BrainLink. For all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Y'all are free to go. Have a great rest of your day.